wave him a lot? Is the mic working? Can you hear? Okay. Uh, founder and CEO of AI Space Factory and uh, former chairman of CTBUH. Uh, some of you may have seen uh, in the news, uh, my company designed uh, what would be the first tall building on Mars. Uh, it's uh, with, uh, together with NASA, uh, part of their uh, Mars challenge. But I wanted to talk to you more about uh, the projects that my company is doing here on Earth. Uh, so AI Space Factory consists of uh, two parts. Uh, first is AI, uh, which is a tech-centric uh, architectural practice which designs solutions for buildings and cities. And then there's Space Factory, uh, which explores and develops technologies to power the former. Uh, and these are our projects. I see architecture and technology as two sides of the same coin. Physical, digital, but they both connect us. So I want to uh, give you my presentation, uh, which I've sort of switched the title. Now it's called Decoding Density. So the idea with density, of course, and this is the, the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, is that essentially density is good. Uh, what we are sort of advocating for is the alternate to urban sprawl, okay, uh, which we feel is more energy intensive. But tall buildings might not be uh, the only solution. Okay, about a year ago uh, at CTBH Sydney, I was on a panel discussion, and the sort of conclusion of that panel was that uh, tall buildings are good for density, but they are crap for collaboration. Uh, so specifically, there's a very major disconnect between the needs of the sharing economy and the spaces which are provided in today's tall buildings. Uh, but rather than discard the tall building for like Silicon Fa uh, Valley <clears throat> low rises, is there a model of a tall building which can do both? Uh, so my company explored this concept in Optics Valley, Wuhan. China has had a lot of development, and it's been plagued by sameness. Okay, so many, many, many towers, uh, very, very similar dimensions, and maybe the external forms and the facades sort of disguise the fact that on the inside, these towers are extremely repetitive. The experiences are very homogenous. Uh, so we uh, were faced with this challenge where we had a potential issue of sameness at uh, 20 city blocks, uh, 18 towers. How can we differentiate the experience uh, of each and individual building? Uh, the idea with Optics Valley is it's, it's uh, Wuhan's response to Silicon Valley. Uh, it's meant to be an innovation uh, area. So we thought about, well, how do you create and generate innovation? Uh, innovation is a mix of spaces, small, big, large. You get your startups, you get your financers, you get your big banks, all within a, a, a you know, walkable district where ideas can be communicated uh, and now uh, connected on a digital platform. Uh, so we developed two typologies. One is a tower, which we literally hacked. Uh, and by hacking the tower, I mean introducing these diagonal chops uh, right through the building and these sort of force uh, an intervention, uh, and a sort of anomaly in the tall building uh, where a sloped ceiling uh, might become a, a theater, right? A sloped floor uh, might become a cafe. Uh, and then the second typology to mix with the towers was the warehouse. Uh, so a high density warehouse, uh, the idea is under one big roof, you could have many, many companies uh, working together. Okay, so the towers, Uh, working together with the warehouses to provide density, but in a form uh, which is more diverse uh, than you would find in a city of simply high rises. Uh, we explore this theme uh, one step further in a project for Ping An. Uh, so Ping An was uh, my client uh, during my time at KPF, and so this is actually the third tower uh, that I've collaborated with them on, uh, but the first with AI. Okay, so, uh, so our tower is the one on the left, Okay, and the idea here was to explore ways to open up towers to the natural environment. And one of the discussions I hear a lot at CTBH is, how does the tower meet the ground? How should the tower meet the ground? Our proposal was, what happens if it doesn't? Right? Uh, so by floating the tower above the ground, in this case, um, 
it was we actually took the pedestrian uh, footpath and, and weaved it in and under the building, lifting the building up so that we're actually engaging uh, the public space in a very, very dynamic way. In addition to this sort of urban gesture, it, it provides an opportunity now uh, to create a fifth facade, uh, another opportunity for the building to breathe. Okay, uh, specifically on the underside of that tower, uh, we would locate uh, essentially these, these moving ceiling panels uh, which respond to the demands of the building's ventilation requirements. So as the air conditioning kicks up to 100%, the ceiling panels will open up in correspondence to that. So you get the sense that the building uh, is responding uh, to the smart building system. So we're beginning to integrate uh, the technology with a design idea. Uh, and we are currently prototyping the system out. Uh, so these are the ceiling panels. They will be upside down in reality, of course, uh, opening up. Okay, the beauty of this is I think then buildings can begin to take on a more responsive quality like something biological. So it's the idea of building as a living machine. Uh, so that's one of the things that technology can do is make buildings which are otherwise static uh, into a system which is highly responsive and, and even in some ways alive. Uh, we explore this theme uh, in Guangzhou at a much, much larger scale. And in this case, it was a ship factory, uh, which was decommissioned, uh, I think, just six months ago. So until very recently, a ship factory. The land was too valuable, uh, so the factory is being relocated, and the entire site is being redeveloped. Uh, so you see something like uh, what amounts to a million square meters over 12 towers. But really, uh, what we were focusing on is, is how to create a very compelling public space. Uh, Guangzhou is really hot and really humid. Uh, if we're in Europe or North America, you can make a big open green field. It becomes a public space because it's comfortable uh, for most of the year. Uh, in Guangzhou, as in Dubai, uh, it doesn't quite work uh, because it's really, really hot. So how do we make great public spaces using design, using technology uh, in climates which are very challenging? Uh, here's what the, the factory looked like six months ago. Um, and rather than sort of toss away all this infrastructure, uh, can we find a way to repurpose it uh, to achieve our objectives? Uh, so one idea is, is just to leave it there, but I think leaving it there and having it just sort of become a, a, a visual artifact is not enough. How do we actually make it performative? Uh, so the idea is to use the old uh, ship docks uh, to bring in river water, uh, and treat that river water as it gets pulled in, uh, actually using these traveling gantries to lift a series of gates uh, to allow that water to be filtered through. Uh, so the idea is that the water is actually cleaned in steps as it's brought in from the river uh, to the point that it can be used. Okay. Now, used for what? Uh, so the idea is that we use the water to feed something which we call the urban cloud. Okay. So the urban cloud is a canopy uh, meant to provide shade, uh, but it is also a smart city device. Uh, so it's equipped with sensors okay, uh, to understand what is the temperature, what is the humidity, and then it's also attached with sensors to understand where are the people. What are they doing? Where are they gathering? Uh, where there are people gathering, uh, then it provides a cooling mist. So the misters come on, make that area of the public space comfortable for the people who are there. So living machines. Uh, so we took that idea one step further and, and, and tried to conceive of an entire building uh, whose form could behave like a living machine. Uh, so this project is in Shenzhen. Uh, we call it Sea Rider. Uh, so it sits right on the uh, entrance to uh, Shenzhen Bay. And the idea here is to explore an other density. Uh, so not tall towers. In this case, we actually displaced about 40% of the building's height and area and translated it to the horizontal. Uh, so this project becomes a sort of form of interconnected spaces and terraces which cascade down to the South China Sea. Uh, so Sea Rider, its form, you can see what it does is then basically the whole building can act as a system 
uh, to support vegetation, to support life, platforms for people to look out at the views and to actually collect and harness uh, the rainwater which falls onto the site, uh, processing, processing it uh, in this lagoon, uh, which we'll be creating at the foot uh, of the project. I think another theme you can see here, as with the Ping An Tower, is the idea of opening up the, build, uh, opening up the bottoms of buildings, uh, the idea of porosity, uh, allowing people, allowing air uh, to be able to filter right through the heart of the project. Uh, so by taking what would have been three sort of identical towers and, and transferring the area into the horizontal, uh, we create this new density, uh, which is actually a courtyard. Uh, so same amount of area, same amount of density, uh, but a very, very different experience from if he had three isolated towers. Okay, and why do it here? Uh, I think it's because of the site. So if the site has something uh, very unique about it, in this case we're overlooking the water, uh, it demands that kind of response. Okay, which brings me to a third theme. Uh, so if architecture and technology connect us, uh, we are also connected via the planet, uh, specifically water. Okay? And if you think of water, and da Vinci said water is the source of all life, 70% uh, of our Earth's surface is covered by water, 70% of our bodies are water. Okay? Uh, it's before there was the internet, there was water. This is what connected the whole world together. Uh, somehow we have lost the potential in using water as a resource because now we depend on cars and automobiles and cell phones. Um, but water has a flip side, right? So nature can be dangerous. Uh, three quarters of the world's largest cities are on the water uh, and they are at risk. So we are kind of building in those locations which are actually the most dangerous to us. So in, in response to this challenge, um, when I was at KPF, I designed uh, what I call my first future city, Next Tokyo. Uh, so Next Tokyo got a lot of publicity because it featured a mile-high tower, uh, and it was built in the middle of Tokyo Bay. Uh, Tokyo, uh, and since we're talking about polycentric cities, Tokyo is a polycentric city, so it's a, it's a collection of, uh, of, of cities which actually ring Tokyo Bay, and this was meant to create a bridge, uh, which would create a shortcut uh, across that bay. And importantly here, the idea was to use architecture as a kind of technological device uh, to sort of block those uh, tsunami waters should they ever come into Tokyo Bay. So it's a, it's a piece of uh, resilient infrastructure. So thinking about something which is both uh, building, right, is density, and is transportation infrastructure, and it's also uh, urban resiliency. So those three themes, okay? Uh, brought together in one project. So the idea about using tall buildings as solutions for these challenges. Now, we were always interested, and when we started AI, uh, to do a follow-up to next Tokyo. So what would be our next future city? And I think by now we had uh, sort of taken on a much more tech-centric thinking. And maybe the solution isn't one uh, singular big uh, mega tower. Maybe the solution is lots of small little things uh, working together. Uh, very much inspired uh, by this project out of Harvard uh, called the Kilobot. So these are tiny coin-sized robots that mimic swarm behavior that you find in nature. So they, they have this ability to either work against each other or work together, uh, but little things creating bigger structures. So we thought, where could we take this idea? Uh, so we invented something we call the hydropod, and the hydropod is meant to be both like Airbnb, it's, it's, it's a house, like Uber, it's transportation on demand, and when it's not doing either thing, uh, it's performing this role in terms of harvesting fog. Uh, so what you're seeing are these sort of fins that lift up and actually pull water out of the fog, and so we thought, well, what city in the world has a lot of fog? Dubai. Uh, so here, um, I'm, I'm pleased to present our concept for what we call Next Dubai, our future city proposal. Uh, so where do we site Next Dubai? Uh, some of you might have been in the morning presentation uh, where there's projects uh, presented uh, on Atlantis on the Palm Jumeirah, but we looked at the other thing out there, which was the world. Uh, so those of you familiar with Dubai know that the world quite hasn't panned out. A lot of the islands there are empty. 
So is there something that we can do uh, to activate the world? Okay, uh, so here you can see the idea of, of using these individual small structures, they begin to aggregate, uh, they begin to cling to the world, uh, defining new edges and connecting these islands together. Okay, so zooming in on that concept. So the wonderful thing about this is these, these uh, hydropods then have the ability to actually sort of, um, how should I say, terraform uh, these islands. So by bringing activity, so they're kind of like a minimal shell, uh, but by engaging uh, with these empty islands, they bring activity to them. They bring a kind of temporary infrastructure. Uh, and then people begin to venture out onto the world uh, and then eventually terraforming the world uh, from the kind of desolate islands that it is now into this uh, sort of wonderful experience of floating out uh, in the middle of the waters of Dubai. The idea about using architecture and resiliency, so now fast forwarding 100 years from now, so the prediction is that by 2100, a lot of Miami will be underwater. Uh, so the, the idea with the hydropods is it also addresses that issue. And unlike Next Tokyo, which, which sort of said, let's put up a wall uh, to resist the water, uh, the hydropods say, we've already crossed that tipping point, unfortunately. Um, I think we've sort of had the chance to reverse climate change uh, because of politics and vested interests. Uh, the current uh, president of the United States, I, I think we are heading in very much the opposite direction. So say we've crossed the tipping point. Uh, global warming is irreversible. Is that the end of humanity? And the answer is no. I think we find a way to adapt. Uh, I think we find ways that we can actually make our cities thrive. Uh, cities are our greatest assets. I think we will develop ways using design, using technology, uh, to adapt our cities to this new world. Okay, and of course, uh, then the, the next step, uh, so assuming we all do well and, and, and uh, you know, we solve our immediate challenges, I think there is long term, and we're talking billions of years, one day the sun will run out of gas. Uh, and we will, if we want to continue as a species, we have to venture out into space. Uh, so the idea is to get that started now, uh, which brings us back uh, to the Mars habitat. Uh, now, we uh, took this project extremely seriously. Uh, we work with uh, the, some of the best engineers in the world. Uh, Dennis Poon from Thornton Tomasetti in the front row uh, was our consulting engineer along with his team. Um, so Marsha, kind of like the way that we designed tall buildings at CTBH, really grew out of a set of scientific physical principles. So the egg shape that you see on the outside is actually designed to contain an Earth-like atmosphere. Mars on the outside has no atmosphere, so the building wants to expand. Okay? Uh, so the egg shape is a pressure vessel uh, which contains that expansion. Uh, Oso and, and TT's team found out that actually the most critical factor was the uh, the severe distortions in the structure uh, caused by temperature variation uh, between night and day. Mars, because it has no atmosphere, has very, very big temperature swings. Uh, so the solution here was to decouple uh, the interior floors from the exterior. So the exterior is free to expand, uh, and then the interior is within this sort of climate-controlled environment, uh, and it doesn't move. So we have an egg within an egg. Okay, now that that inside egg is sort of, um, doesn't have to withhold the atmosphere, it is free to be uh, as mass optimized as possible. Uh, so the challenge with Mars is we don't have much material, uh, so we need to completely optimize the design of anything that we would put on Mars. Okay, and then you get this wonderful space. So, so the idea here, and you've probably seen Martian habitats which are like a dome or a bunker, uh, is to create something which is an expression, I, I think, of what makes us human. Uh, so this idea of uh, sort of elevating one's spirit. So here, sort of walking through multiple floors uh, in this space uh, between the two eggshells, uh, feeling like it's a home, maybe a home away from home, uh, but something that's better than living in a bunker. Now, there's one catch uh, with this all, and, and this is that uh, Marsha needs to be uh, 3D printed. 
Uh, so the challenge of building on Mars uh, is that uh, to transport materials uh, to Mars from Earth uh, would be sort of prohibitively expensive uh, because the cost of launching material into space, uh, you would need 90% fuel for every 10% of rocket that you took up. So send one robot to Mars and have it use the materials around it uh, to print 100 homes. So 100 homes for one robot. So that's, that's the concept. Uh, with this proposal. Okay, so there it is. Now, um, so we, we did the design with TT, um, but the actual challenge for NASA is to print a prototype. Uh, rather than uh, let someone have the fun, we decided to do it ourselves. And, and so this is where and I got back to the beginning, the concept of our company is to actually, not just do the design, but also to, to develop the technologies which enable the design. Uh, so with a little assistance from Autodesk, uh, so they gave us some space uh, up in Boston, and they gave us this very, very, very big robot. Um, we attached a thermoplastic extruder uh, to the end of it, uh, sort of repurposing an agricultural uh, feeder uh, to supply these pellets. Uh, and we are printing, okay? Um, I think about two weeks ago we were printing pancakes and now this is more like Cinnabons, okay? So we've, we've been able to get more control uh, over what we're doing. Um, so it, now it's just a simply a question of scaling it up. Uh, the material that we're using uh, is actually a mixture of bioplastic. Okay? So the idea is that you grow corn on Mars or you harvest it on the way there, uh, mixed with basalt, okay? Which is rock, that's the, 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 the rock that you have on Mars. Uh, so these two things are fed into this extruder, which then melts that mixture, uh, and we can print uh, whatever structures we can imagine. Okay, it has an advantage uh, over concrete printing uh, because of the precision. Uh, its disadvantage is the speed, uh, because concrete just simply has more volume. So these are the challenges uh, that we're going to have to overcome in order to construct a one to third uh, scale prototype of this on site uh, in Illinois uh, in April of next year. Okay, so that's the sort of end of the density story. So if you can imagine, um, as we're densifying the Earth, we're finding new solutions, we're adapting to climate change. Uh, but the end of the story is one of uh, dispersion, I suppose. So we, we venture out into the stars. Okay, uh, but to pull things back, uh, again, to close to our planet. Uh, why, why are we doing this? So why, is, why are my <coughs> colleagues and I uh, just, you know, doing the things that we're doing. And you know, we all came out of an experience of working on tall buildings together, and tall buildings are great. Um, but if you look at the scene of Shenzhen, you can see what we're actually doing is terraforming the Earth. Right? Urbanization is shaping our planet. Uh, if we believe in a sustainable future, and I do, uh, and if we want to find ways to get there, then we need to develop sufficiently advanced technology to get us there. Disruptive changes in the way that we design, build, and operate our cities. So we set out to create the company, the architecture company of the future, okay, uh, which would be able to work on those sorts of projects. Okay, the blue dot in our logo is in reference uh, to the story of Voyager, the spacecraft. And as it was six billion miles away from Earth, took back, uh, looked back and took a photo of our planet uh, called the pale blue dot. Uh, it emphasizes the fragility of our planet. So if we are to realize uh, this sustainable future, we must uh, commit ourselves to it, uh, develop these technologies, think about these designs, have these philosophies, uh, and work harder uh, to make a better world together. Thank you.